We've always perceived ourselves as people of freedom. Freedom of equality. Of human decency. Of the right to live without fear. These freedoms have been given to us by many who sacrificed greatly. And somehow, we've believed that the war has been won. That we have arrived. But if we open our eyes, we can see that the dream has not yet been fully realized. That there are still battles to fight. Still inequalities present. Still souls suffering. That our faith demands more than awareness and that no generation is exempt from these battles. But we are held responsible to stand, to do justly, to love mercy, and to serve the least of these. Good morning, good morning, Unity. Good morning, and welcome to our Black History Month celebration. As we all know, February is a month that is used to celebrate the people that came before us and the adversities that they went through and the the struggles you know that they had to go through to help us today. But also remember, we also are celebrating the history that is to be made that youth will be making. So it's just to celebrate the beauty of being black. So we're going to start off with a prayer, a scripture, and then after that we'll have amazing videos, songs, words of encouragement, and then we'll have a skit from our youth. So we're going to start off with a prayer. I ask that everyone please bow their heads. All right, so we just want to thank you, God, for bringing us together one more time, God. We just want to thank you for making this week go by, God. You know, whatever they went through, God, let them give their worries to you, God, because we know that you control it all, God. We thank you for the past, the present, and the future, God. God, we thank you for just giving us the opportunity to praise you every day, God. See, because I feel we don't say thank you enough sometimes, God. So I just want to take a moment and say thank you. I don't want to ask you for nothing. I just want to thank you for bringing us all here, letting us see the beautiful youth of today, God. God, I just ask that you make this week, this day, a beautiful blessing. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, y'all. And then our scripture is coming from 1 Peter 2, 16 and 17. Look, don't butcher me if I, I mess that up. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil, but live as a servant of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So just remember to keep God first, y'all. Bye. And hope everything else is so beautiful. Hey Black Child by County Cullen. Hey Black Child, do you know who you are? Who you really are? Do you know you can be who you want to be? If you try to be what you can be. Hey Black Child, do you know where you're going? Where you're really going? Do you know you can learn what you want to learn? If you try to learn what you can learn. Hey Black Child, do you know you are strong? I mean, really strong do you know you can do what you want to do if you try to do what you can do hey black child be what you can be learn what you must learn do what you can do and tomorrow your nation will be what you want it to be
than before. I wanna sing louder than before. I wanna jump higher than before. I wanna scream louder than before. Freedom!
The black church is important and played a significant role in the lives of African Americans, creating change politically and change in the black community. The black church often partnered with those leading the work of social justice in our communities by holding rallies, voting drives, hosting political leaders, and sharing inspiring gospel music with those fighting the battles for civil rights, such as the Blind Boys of Alabama who toured the South during the Jim Crow era. Gospel music in the black community was like therapy. The church choirs brought hand clapping, foot stomping rhythms and songs with biblical themes to uplift spiritually. I can still hear my grandmother's strong alto singing those old hymns like Sweet Low Sweet Chariot and Is Not This the Land of Beulah, Blessed, Blessed Land of Light. Songs that pierce the soul who, and who can forget the tent revivals. Many of us can share wonderful memories growing up in the black church, but there are some who didn't get this spiritual teaching and preaching experience. Today we have two people, one who will share how growing up have inspired them and uplifted them, and, the, and one who will contrast with how they missed out on this experience. One of the biggest inspirations to me growing up in the black church was really a couple of things. Uh, on Sunday, there was a understanding of respect and honor due to those who were elders or in position of leadership that was given to them by those of us who were younger and who knew without being told to behave a certain way as young as as children growing up in the church you knew and understand understood the unwritten rules and that was really an inspiration to me growing up how to act how to behave as a young man without even being uh written down or without even being, as they say, counseled today, it was understood. Your behavior was really important when you came into the sanctuary or into the house of the Lord. Not only that, even on the church grounds, there were unwritten rules about how to behave and how to act. And uh, somehow, uh, through those uh, elders, through those in leadership, they didn't need permission to correct you when you were out of order. They just did what they knew what was right. That that really inspired me as I got older and looked back to see what really took place. And one of my uh, biggest inspiration was growing up in the household. I'm a age 12, 13, 14 uh, in the household with my grandmother. She had got older in her age close to 90s and needed someone to just make sure she didn't burn the house down or make sure the uh, doors was locked at night and stuff like that, just, just regular stuff. But one thing that really got me about her was she couldn't read, she couldn't write, neither could her sisters. Uh, they couldn't read or write, but they knew scripture. They understood scripture. They knew what scripture was in the Bible without being able to read and write. And it was revealed to me later as a, I got older that it was the Holy Spirit. And being an honor roll student from seventh grade uh, to about 10th when I started parting, getting wild, um, it was revealed to me that that same spirit that taught her and helped her to understand stand the scriptures and know they were in the Bible was the same spirit that taught me how to be an honor roll student while I was in uh, seventh through 10th grade. How real the Holy Spirit was and how real the Holy Spirit still is today. And, and those are two of my biggest inspiration growing up with that 90 year old grandmother who couldn't read or write, but who could tell you where certain things were in the Bible and could explain them to you that as a young man, you could understand exactly what she was saying. And again, the respect and the honor that was given uh, 
to those in leadership, uh, to those elders that were in the church, unwritten rules on how to act and behave as a kid growing up in church. Those are two of my biggest inspiration uh, growing up as a young man in the black church. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, Unity. Um, I do understand the significance and the importance of the black church, but only now. When I grew up, my life was, by contrast, the opposite of the black church. I grew up in the Catholic church where we were more into rituals, religion, and traditions. For example, while we had a Bible at home, Bible study wasn't conducted either at church, but sometimes at home, because I did have some old aunties and some grandmas that would take you to the Bible. But at church, it was more about studying the ways of Catholicism. And in fact, we had something that you called a missal. And the missal might have a scripture for a day. It might take something from the Bible, from John, or from mostly from the New Testament. And the priest would only quote that on Sunday, but he never taught it. And then the rest of Mass, when you went to church, the rest of Mass was done in Latin. So oftentimes you're sitting there in church wondering what he's even talking about. If you didn't study Latin, or you didn't know what hymn he was singing because it was in another language, you were, you were lost. And so that was my experience growing up. But I went to public school. And in going to public school, my friends all went to Baptist, AME, and CME churches, etc. And they would talk about uh, Baptist Training Union and things like that, BTU, I believe that's what I remember. And I had a longing to know what their experience was all about. Uh, I had no idea. I just knew that they seemed to have fun during the summer times and spring breaks when they got together with their church friends, whereas our church friends never got together. We didn't get together for uh, missile training on Sundays. We missed out on the whole black experience. It wasn't until I became an adult when I left the Catholic Church to my grandmother's my sisters, my family's dismay. They were disheartened when I left the church. But the spirit that was in me that had this longing for God wasn't being given to me. So when I left the church and went to my first Baptist church, I knew I had arrived. I was at home and now being fulfilled through the spirit. Didn't mean that I didn't have the spirit in me or a connection or a relationship with God, but I didn't really understand the full depth of what Jesus Christ had done. And that's what the black church does give us. It takes us right to the word of God, teaches us the word of God, who he is, and what Jesus Christ really did for us. So it wasn't until I was almost 30 before I learned that. So I want to say that the black church is important, not just because of the singing and the way, hymns, are, hymns don't get it, by the way, let me add that. I got tired of the hymns, but it gets to the depth of who we are in Christ. It's very important for our children to have that, and not having that, I realized that it lacked. I'm not knocking the Catholic Church. The emphasis just is not on God and Jesus Christ, and I needed that, and that's what the Black Church gives us. Cheyenne has been waiting all year to attend the annual Black History Museum in Fayetteville, Georgia. There's so much richness in Black heritage, and she's eager to learn more as she explores the museum. Thankfully, she was able to get tickets with her little sister. As they wait in line for their turn, the anticipation of excitement grows even more. Sit back, relax, and watch each character come to life and to inspire both girls and hopefully you too. I'm so excited. I always wanted to come here. I love history. It's so inspiring. I'm so glad we got tickets. Yay! I'm excited too. Great, let's go in. Hello. Hey. 
morning. Well, welcome to our first annual Black History Museum. Here we are honoring African Americans who have come before us, who have had many struggles and many triumphs and celebrations along the way. Here you'll learn all about them. Feel free to take pictures, post it to your social media, tell your friends to come out. History is so important and I'm so glad you guys are, you girls are here. Um, here's a pamphlet that will assist you as you are walking through the museum. Feel free again to take any pictures that you need and we hope you enjoy. Come back and see us. Look, there's the Obama. Oh yes, let's take a picture. They don't always do it like that. I just love them. Who's that? I don't even know if it's touch the face or the sea. Born Marshall Walter Taylor, but everybody knows me as Major Taylor, the cyclist. I am the second black athlete to hold a world championship in any sport. However, the first African American to win a world championship in sprint cycling. I was born on November 26, 1878 in Indianapolis, Indiana. My parents was poor, but managed to get me a bike. I began my professional bike riding career in 1896 at the age of 18. During this era, racing was sweeping across the nation. It was horrible. I traveled the world competing in several races including Australia, Europe, and most countries in North America. But there were struggles of racial segregation and the competition as black athletes were not valued. We received insults by white fans and fellow white cyclists. I mean, one time a cyclist knocked me off my bike and left me unconscious. With the intense racism and intimidation I experienced, I decided to retire at the age of 32. I died from a heart attack on June 21, 1932 at the age of 53. My advice to you, whether it is athletic fame or a professional career, practice clean living, fair play, and good sportsmanship. Wow, that was so hard back in those days. I can't even imagine. Come on, let me get a picture with you and him. Hi, my name is Mamie Jameson. I'm a doctor and an engineer, but most people know me as the first African-American woman to travel in space. I was born on October the 17th, 1956, and I knew early in my life I wanted to study science. I remember growing up and watching the Apollo airing on TV, but was often upset that there was no female astronauts. Until I saw actress Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Ahara on the Star Trek television show, I was inspired and determined to one day travel in space. Once I graduated high school, I was on my way. I left Chicago to attend Stanford University in California. I was the only African-American student in my class. And as a result, unfortunately, I experienced racial discrimination in school, but that didn't stop me. I graduated in 1977 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemical Engineering and a Bachelor of Art degree in African. And then I joined the Peace Corps in 1983, serving as a medical officer for two years in Africa. Later, I had the opportunity to open my own private practice as a doctor. In 1985, I applied for NASA astronaut program and I was chosen out of 2,000 applicants. I was excited and surprised. A day I will never forget, September the 12th, 1992. Myself and six others went into space on the space shuttle Endeavour. Now listen, don't let anyone rob you of your imagination, your creativeness, or your curiosity. It's your place in the world. It's your life. So go on, do what you can do with it, and make it the life you want to live. I'm going to do that when I grow up. I can see you doing that. That was cool.
for. Let's get another picture so I can post this on her IG story. I'm Dorothy Vaughn. I was born September 20th, 1910. I became the first African-American woman to hold a supervisory position and help the institution transition to computer programming. During my early years, I graduated from high school at the age of 15. I was also the class valedictorian. I then went on to Wilberforce University, which is a historically black college in Ohio. Here I studied mathematics. Later on, I married my husband and I became a high school teacher. In 1943, during World War II, I took a job at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, as a computer. That's right, a computer. I taught myself the programming language Fortran that was used for early computing. And from there, I taught it to many of my colleagues so they would be prepared for the inevitable transition away from manual computing and towards electronics. During those times, women could not be hired as engineers. Instead, we were given the role as acting head of the group which did not come with the title or the pay. In 1958, NACA became NASA and segregated facilities were completely and finally abolished. In 1971, I retired at the age of 71. However, I continued to be active in my community and my church throughout my retirement years. On November 10th, 2008, at the age of 98, I went on to be with the Lord. I changed what I could, and what I couldn't, I endured. Good morning, Unity. I am Chelsea Boynton, and I'm going to share a word of encouragement for the youth. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So to simply break these verses down, it means that whenever you're facing a trial, which is like a test or an obstacle or just something difficult that you may be going through, that you should remain joyful. Now, I know what your next question is. How can I be joyful when I have to do something that I don't want to do, something that's difficult or stressful or makes me uncomfortable? How can I stay joyful? 
The answer is to remember this very important fact. The joy that the world gives is not the same joy that the Holy Spirit gives. The joy that comes from the Holy Spirit comes from understanding your purpose. Understanding that God created you and put you here for a very special reason. To lead people to Christ. Now, don't take this mission lightly because he only gives it to his strongest soldiers and you've been called to be one. Real joy comes from understanding and using the power that you have to positively impact the lives of those around you. The choices you make in life can cause your friends to make the same choices. So for example, let's say every day when you get to school, you say a quick prayer. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And every day you have a great day. Even if something goes wrong, you still have a beautiful smile on your face and a friendly attitude that people love to be around. So your friends start to see the blessing that's on your life and how loving you are, and they want to experience that too. So you tell them the prayer that you say. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And now your friends are saying that same prayer when they come to school in the morning, but it doesn't stop there. Your friends have started saying it at home and now their families are saying the prayer. Your basketball team is saying it. Your dance class has started saying it. You may have even heard your football coach say it during practice one day. You and your prayer have now positively impacted the entire community. And that is real joy. That is the joy that only comes from knowing God and knowing that the trial you're facing will strengthen you to help his people. So I want to share with you three things that I do that has gotten me through every single trial. The first thing I do is I speak praises. We can choose to focus on the good or the bad. And what we focus on is usually what we talk about. So choose to be thankful and to speak praise. The second thing I do is speak God's word. Sometimes we can get in our own heads and doubt ourselves or believe others when they doubt us. To combat that doubt, I speak God's word and choose to believe what God says about me over what others say about me. One verse you can speak is Philippians 4 8 and you'll say it like this. I choose to meditate on anything that has virtue or is praiseworthy. I think about things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. The final thing I do is I speak victory. I guarantee you that you will be victorious. But remember, sometimes victory may not look like what we've imagined or what we've been wanting, but it's exactly what God knows we need. Because true victory is having a God that blesses us, loves us, and forgives us. In 2022, you may come face to face with trials of many kinds. Remember to keep God first. Let him lead you and trust in his plan. Thank you, Unity. God bless you. I love you. And I will see you soon. Bye.